The history of the East India Company is a study of the relationship between commercial and imperial power. It looks at how corporations impact on politics and vice versa. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the sixth episode of Chicago Dialogue, season two. Um, I'm Deepesh Chakrabarty. I teach history and South Asian languages and civilizations at the University of Chicago. And I'm currently also the faculty director of the University of Chicago Center in Delhi. And um, this series, as you know, is produced by our Delhi Center in collaboration with Prohor.in uh, and the best-selling author of a book on Dara Shuko, of Vikchanda, uh, has been acting as the anchor for, for this series. Today, I welcome you to a wonderful episode where we are absolutely honored and thrilled to host the renowned writer, uh, uh, and historian, William Dalrymple, uh, in conversation with three of my esteemed colleagues, Sunit Singh, uh, Stephen, we call him Steve, Pinkas, and James Vaughan, who are also on the screen with us. Sunit will do the formal introducing of everybody. Um, all I can say uh, very briefly is uh, I'm personally so delighted to have William, whose books on, <clears throat> well, the Anarchy, The Last Mughal, White Mughals, uh, The City of Jin. I mean, Jin's have been our, on our reading list in many courses. We discuss and, 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 and debate them. Uh, and these are books that have had tremendous impact, both on academic writing of history as well as uh, what I've elsewhere called the public life of history in, in, in India and elsewhere. And uh, today, my colleague Steve Pincus will act as the moderator uh, for this uh, program. Uh, Stephen is the Thomas Donnelly Professor of History in the Department of History. Uh, he's the Professor of British History and the college. Uh, he has revolutionized the study of British Empire, at least the academic study of British Empire. Uh, and his book on the 1688 revolution has won many prizes. Um, he's a, the only thing I might do by way of introducing him quickly is quote him on his approach to <laughs> British Empire. And, and you will see what a revolutionary historian he is. And he says, I'm quoting Steve, I insist <clears throat> that accounts of the colonies that focus on the binary relationship between a particular colony and a set of colonies in Britain will necessarily misunderstand that relationship. The British Empire can only be understood as a global phenomenon. With that, and thanking my colleagues, both at Prohor.in and at the Delhi Center, uh, I just conclude uh, this brief introduction uh, and my welcome to you all uh, to the discussion that follows. And now, um, over to you, Sunit. Thank you, Dipesh. Um, I want to thank um, Avek and uh, Suman and Lenny and 
uh, Wendy Doniger, who first connected me to Will. Um, and I want to thank everyone else for tuning in. Um, a brief introduction uh, to Will, who needs no introduction, but uh, uh, William Dalrymple is the best selling author of the Wolfson Prize winning White Moguls. Uh, he's also the author of The Last Mogul, which won the Duff Cooper Prize, the Hemingway and Kapuscinski Prize winning Return of the King. Um, he uh, is, uh, his most recent book is The Anarchy, which we will uh, discuss uh, today, uh, which was long listed for the Bailey Gifford uh, Prize in 2019 uh, and was shortlisted for the Duke of Wellington Medal for Military History. Uh, the Tata Book of the Year, um, and the Historical Writers uh, Association Book Award for 2020. Uh, it was also a finalist for the Cund Hill Prize for History and won the 2020 Arthur Ross Medal uh, from the U.S. Council on Foreign Relations. Um, Will is the recipient of a handful of honorary doctorates, uh, is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, uh, the Royal Asiatic Society and the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and has held visiting fellowships at Princeton, at Brown, and at Oxford. Uh, he writes regularly for the New York <coughs> New Books, uh, The New Yorker, and The Guardian. In 2018, he was presented uh, the prestigious President's Medal by the British Academy uh, and was named one of the world's top 50 thinkers uh, for 2020 by Prospect. He is also the founder and co-director of the Jaipur Literary Festival. Um, I'll be joined in conversation with uh, Steve Pincus, uh, who has been introduced already by Dipesh, but he is once again, Thomas E. Domling, Professor of British History uh, at the University of Chicago uh, and author of 1688, The Modern uh, the First Modern Revolution, uh, which came out in 2011, uh, and it's, itself is the um, uh, won a number of prizes. Um, he's presently completing a book on the global history of the British Empire. Um, I'm uh, also joined uh, with by my friend and colleague, uh, James Vaughan, uh, who himself is a historian of the East India Company and wrote a marvelous book, The Politics of Empire at the Accession of George III, The East India Company and the Crisis and Transformation of Britain's Imperial State, which came out in 2019 um, alongside Will's uh, book, The Anarchy. Uh, and I am uh, Sunit Singh. I teach uh, in the college uh, and actually teach a course on the East India Company. And I'm the co-director of the Social Sciences Writing Program here at the University of Chicago. Will, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, it's a, a huge honor and, uh, and a great pleasure, particularly to meet uh, James. Because it sounds like our two books are sort of perfectly complementary to each other. They came out the same year. Mine very much focuses on the Mughal and the Indian background of uh, uh, the rise of the company, while his book focuses very much on the metropolitan side of things. And, and I think that uh, the, the two read together would uh, would provide a, a wonderful whole. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Um, so uh, can I can I just say I mean first of all how excited I am to have uh, William Dalrymple here to have this discussion. It's uh, you know his uh, uh, his four books on uh, have been the source of discussion among you know students uh, uh, both under undergraduates and graduates for for you know for some time, um, and it's also really great to have to have seen it and and James uh, uh, who are really sort of. Uh, in involved in th sort of thinking about the 18th century broadly uh, in South Asia and as part of this discussion. Um, I'm mostly going to just sort of moderate, but I thought maybe just to kick things off, I would ask uh, in, uh, a sort of general question to, uh, to, uh, to, to William, uh, which is just, I, I mean, reading the anarchy, uh, um, which is, you know, a delight no matter how how one spins it. Um, one of the remarkable things, I mean, I sort of thought about this as, as the, one of the first things I point out to students is um, how deft uh, and, and important is the use of, of Persian source material, which is, you know, quite 
different from what most people who've written about these this subject or these subjects, that is to say the making of uh, uh, the coming of the East India Company to, to, to South Asia. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us and sort of uh, to talk to us a bit about what you see as, as the advantages of using the Persian sources. I mean, what do you see by using these uh, Persian sources that we, that, you know, previous scholars um, who focus mostly, to be honest, on English language sources or perhaps European sources from the Dutch East India Company, the French East India Company, what do you, what do you gain by, by using these Persian sources? Well, I, I blush to, to answer that question uh, in a University of Chicago seminar where Muzaffar Alam is the presiding genius. And uh, uh, Muzaffar, of course, has spent his entire life uh, using rare Persian sources with incredible effect. And, and all of us have learned a huge amount from him. But I think it, uh, you, as you say, most people who study 18th century, most people who study empire mainly study the English sources. And that's as true of, of work coming out of India. Uh, as it is work coming out of uh, America or Britain or Europe. And it is simply astonishing how much unused primary material there is in archives all over uh, South Asia, simply because obviously Persian, which was the language of government and, and of letters and of diplomacy in South Asia from the 12th century right up until the 19th century, is a language which is extinct here. And the particular forms of Persian which uh, were used uh, often sound very odd to a, to a modern Persian ear, uh, or uh, slightly less odd to an Afghan ear, but uh, uh, they, are, they are basically an extinct language. And the number of people, even in, in you know, in Delhi is a, is a city with, with three universities with, with major and, and, and important history departments, but the number of people that can easily read Mughal sources fluently uh, um, are, 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 are fewer and fewer each year. And I was incredibly lucky to work very closely with a remarkable scholar called Bruce Winnell on all four of my company books. Bruce lived in Iran for many years, then moved to Peshawar and had one of those people that could pick up languages like most of us pick up COVID. Uh, he, he, was, he was a sort of spectacular, uh, had every European language. He also, which I think probably was part of the same thing, he, he, was, he was a wonderful musician and, and could play anything as a, a, with the same facility. And um, we used to go around places like Tonk, Patna, uh, the National Archives in Delhi, but also the incredible uh, 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 amount of Persian material sitting in the British Library, the most obvious place of all. Uh, and, and and we'd find that not only was most of it completely unused, that even the catalogue entries were, were often very misleading and that we'd have to wade through pages of, uh, of, uh, 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 of written sources uh, and often find that the catalogue entry was completely wrong and we'd be, you know, be 100 years out uh, when we actually uh, got it... Uh, into into a manuscript and um, one could spend weeks getting a manuscript out of a, a place like Tonk, which is very difficult to work in and very even more difficult to get permission to do photocopies or photographs in. Um, and, and then find that in fact the the the, the, the um, contents are quite other than, than than what you've been led to believe. But when you strike lucky uh, uh, you can find incredible material that simply has never been looked at before. And of course, in, in a field like this, where, uh, you know, um, it's increasingly rare to find e even, you know, even, even single documents that are both important and unread, um, to find, you know, whole libraries full of material that have simply not been looked at mm -hmm. since they were put in the, in the British Library or somewhere in the uh, provin some provincial library in, in India for 100, 150 years ago. Um, you know, it, it is an unbelievable resource. And, and Bruce could translate this stuff as easily as, uh, as most of us, you know, could, could, can, can read the front page of the New York Times. He, he had a fantastic facility, and, but he didn't know the history. And we'd work through these manuscripts that we'd photocopied together. Um, and uh, Bruce, having d completed the four books which make up this company quartet, died of, uh, uh, of cancer. Um, just after the publication of the Anarchy, uh, and it's a huge loss uh, because I mean, really, I, uh, I mean, I've, I've worked with many scholars, uh, 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 and, and I've never met anyone that had a couple of people in in, in Delhi, uh, but uh, very, very few people can 
uh, can read this material as fluently as he could. And, and also he had a beautiful, beautiful turn of phrase and, and was a, a, an incredibly tr uh, talented translator. And, so, and, the, and the, the translations he produced from the Bratnama and, and, and so on uh, are, are, great, um, are great works in themselves. So I'm very much, a, 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 I feel like in a sense that the door to Narnia has closed. I've locked out of the, uh, the magic cupboard uh, slightly uh, since, he, since he left. And, I, and I've done something completely different over the last few years, like just, just for a change. Um, but, but, they, but that is, I mean, in a sense, I think if, if, this, if this book has any contribution at all, uh, uh, other than a pacey read, uh, it is in 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 that in those wonderful translations that uh, Bruce has produced and and accessing uh, really quite obscure documents from from a variety of provincial libraries that simply haven't been looked at before, uh, and hence in a sense the, the the concentration on 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 the mogul background to the company, uh, and, and this is very much the story of the rise of the company set against the decay of mogul power. And and I and I suppose the, the the principal balance, the yin and yang of the book, if you like, is is playing off Clive, who was such a astonishingly uh, successful but ruthless and and, and it's a brutal man in many ways. Uh, and and Shah Alam, who was the opposite, who was enormously civilized, wrote poetry in six languages, good looking, brave, honorable, and lost every battle he ever fought, and, and, and his, whose whole political life was a, was a sort of spectacular tragedy and failure. Um, and 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 that trope, I think, is at the, uh, the, the 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 central idea of the book, in a sense, the central spine of the book. That sounds perfect. That might be a good place to pivot to, to James Vaughn. Do you? Uh, well, you first off, William, it's an honor to share a platform with you. Uh, I've been a huge fan of your work, not just in the anarchy, but going back to the entire grand vision you presented of the rise and development of the British Empire on the Indian subcontinent during the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about the anarchy, having both brilliantly analyzed and narrated the rise and development of the British East India Company from a commercial corporation to a territorial empire. I wanted to sort of maybe ask what historians would call a counterfactual question, but I would rather <laughs> pose it as an imaginative one. And I think all historians of the East India Company have faced this at some point, which is, um, you know, many European and South Asian voices at the time of the later 18th century thought that there was a possibility of a different relationship between Europe and Asia, more specifically between Britain and India and um, were quite critical of what men like Clive were doing and the kind of early company Raj that was being put into place. And I guess I wanted to ask you, do you think those voices were utopian, meaning could it have been otherwise? And, and to say the same question in another way, was there a possibility not for a kind of autarky between Europe and Asia, but rather a different encounter between Britain and India, a different form of interdependence arising and developing? Well, what a lovely question. Um, yes, I do, actually. And, and my first book of, of, of these four books, White Moguls, uh, is really a look at that. Um, we have such a, a clear idea in our heads of what colonialism is all about, and, and particularly the British Empire, and you know, instantly images of sort of Lord Curzon and, and guys in empire building shorts and, and solar topies having a slash at uh, Indian protesters in white car cargi in, the, in, in Connaught Place. And so much of the actual social history of the, of the 18th century is, is, is so completely apart from that. And I came to this um, through... Um, I, I'd written in my in my very early twenties, just, just straight out of college, a book called City of Gins, uh, which was uh, a travel book rather than a history book. But but in that, I tumbled down the rabbit hole uh, of a family archive of my wife's family, uh, and was looking at this character William Fraser, who very much defied every. Uh, idea of uh, every stereotype of imperialism. He um, he was a great patron of Ghalib. He collected uh, Mughal miniatures. He wore Indian clothes. Uh, he got involved in Indian blood feuds. He had uh, 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 many Indian children, but had one particular wife in the end who who, who, he, who he lived with in Haryana, um, and uh, was a great patron of uh, of uh, Ghulam Ali Khan and Mazar Ali Khan, the great company school painters of uh, uh, and, and painters of the late Mughal court. <laughs> and was a man 
who uh, um, uh, Shah Waliullah described as the, uh, as, as the most uh, interesting Ferengi he'd ever met, and the only one we, we give time to. Uh, and um, from that, I went on to do White Moguls, because it turned out that this, this guy was not, you know, a one-off, that there was a whole, this, a brief moment, really. It's got, it's got a moment between particularly sort of 1760 and about 1810, about, it's about sort of 50 years. Uh, when there were hundreds of these characters around, David Octoloney, James Kirkpatrick in Hyderabad uh, was the one I particularly focused on, who fell in love with South Asia and fell in love with South Asian women, had mixed race children, and, and lived very much the kind of lives that uh, that many people, you know, with mixed race families lead today, uh, and whose and whose houses. Um, and, and private lives, you know, mixed two worlds where, you know, they were possibly uh, uh, yeah, sitting at a table but eating Indian food with their hands, uh, the pictures of women, uh, uh, Indian women um, uh, sitting on, on European furniture but but smoking a hookah, wearing nose rings. And, and you get this impression of two worlds mixing as they, as they do today, every day, in, in any American university, in any... In any uh, 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 multicultural town anywhere in the world, uh, but it's not what we expect from imperialism. It's 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 a very different image to, to what we expect from the colonial world. And um, so yes, so the, the, I mean, the, it, it, there was no necessary uh, historical imperative that we would end up with the. Uh, deeply extractive and exploitative and uh, and brutal form of colonialism that we did. I mean, uh, the history of human interaction, you know, has a whole variety of of different forms of interaction between peoples, ranging from massacres and bloodshed and and and, and genocides through to you know massive intermarriages and the fusions of culture and and and. The history of the British of the British in India has, uh, you know, a, a variety of those different possibilities, uh, ranging from from uh, harmonious interaction to outright genocide and uh, and mass murder, um, uh, and and any one of them, in a sense, could have could have been the um, the main form of imperialism, as it was. Uh, you know, imperialism was deeply extractive and, and brutal and the white moogles lost in the sense um, but yes but thank you that's a lovely question and yes i do think that there, there, there were um, there were many possibilities when two different peoples meet thank you Senate, yeah go ahead yeah uh if i may william uh well build on sort of uh, about steve's question and uh, james's in different ways i mean uh one is to ask about maybe the limitations of some of the persian sources given that they were uh, written in a courtly milieu. Uh, and then to contrast that with the other side of the story that you tell quite remarkably in the anarchy of South Asians who were involved in the making of company rule in India, um, apart from the Jagat Seth, who, who sort of bankrolled the Plassey Revolution. Uh, there were clearly merchants and others who took refuge in Calcutta. Uh, and not to mention, of course, the, the thousands who were enrolled as sepoys in, in the company army. Um, what you make of sort of their role in, in the formation <laughs> of the lodge? Well, I think, I think you're right. I mean, I think, the, in a sense, the two main uh, props to British rule were, on one hand, um, the initially small, but, but by the end, very, very large number of Indian sepoys who made up the East India Company forces. The the figures are surprising for anyone that doesn't know this this period of history. The the um, British Army in 1799, uh, when they were about to uh, uh, rearm to fight Napoleon, had 100,000 soldiers. Uh, the same year, the East India Company Army had 200,000 uh, brown Indian sepoys who uh, fought for uh, a corporation. Um, uh, and uh, uh, and it, it, it's, it, I mean, I don't think you can overemphasize what a strange bit of history this is. That you have a, uh, you have Indian soldiers, uh, mercenary soldiers, fighting for a corporation, the, the 18th century equivalent of Facebook or Google or ExxonMobil or any other great multinational corporation that spans continents and is incredibly powerful. And um, 
where's this money coming from? It's coming partly from, um, well, by the by the end of the 18th century, coming from from land revenue, which is which is uh, gathered in great quantities uh, by the East India Company, and then increasingly effectively after the uh, uh, after the permanent settlement. Uh, but it's also gathered from astonishingly again weirdly to our eyes from from uh, readily gathered from indian bankers and uh, this is something which you know is work has been done in academia obviously for for 40 years from kumkum chatterjee and, and and chris bailey in the 80s uh, through to a whole range of other people since then but i think it's still a surprise to to most readers certainly you know very few indians brought up on nationalist textbooks imagine that their own bankers actually bankrolled these to become less still the, the the fact, which you know, again is sort of astonishing to us all, really in retrospect, that the that Plassey was a, a setup um, of of a bunch of Mawari bankers who paid the East India Company to get rid of Sir Sir Dalla. That's not how it's taught in in in, in school books, either in Britain in the uh, when it was taught in British school books or in Indian nationalist states. But it is the fact. It, there's no getting away from this. They they paid for Plassey. Uh, and and both Mir Jaffer and Clive were 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 in their uh, on their bankroll. Um, so I think those are the two principal uh, allies uh, on the Indian side. But there's also, um, I think, after the permanent settlement, mm. when you when um, so much of the old zamindari land is put up for auction, uh, you get a whole new class of Hindu tradesmen uh, who also become part of uh, kind of the, the British uh, 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 support base. Um, families like the Debs, the Mullick, the Tagores, uh, who have done very well out of, uh, 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 out of the breakup of, of, uh, of the Mughals. And, and uh, I don't want to sound like, like uh, uh, some sort of BJP politician, but clearly there's, l- there's a lot of Hindu support uh, for the British, often in opposition to the Mughals and, and people um do see um the the company as as, as, as a viable alternative to mogul rule uh, and and it is the largely hindu trading classes and particularly the financiers and the bankers uh who ally with the british and i think you know it, it, again for anyone watching this who's, who who doesn't know this world i mean it, one, one one can in a sense think of 18th century Calcutta, a bit like Singapore or Dubai today. It's it's a place that has very low taxes, that where you, where you can uh, escape from the, the heavy hand of government as a, as a businessman, not as a not as a polit- uh, in political terms, but as a businessman, and where businesses can flourish, which is why the Mawaris went there, all the way from Rajasthan, our mass at this time, and and took refuge there. Uh, and and the question that's interesting is, you know, why why would a bunch of businessmen from the other side of India Go and 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 make their homes in a British settlement, um, at particularly at a time when the British are aggressive and rude and racist, and and there's a white town and a black town and all sorts of very unpleasant things going on there. Uh, and the answer is that they, that they make a profit from the company, uh, and the company provides an environment which allows these financiers. Uh, to flourish, and the, while they may loot and pillage and rape and and do all sorts of unpleasant things, uh, they pay their uh, they repay their debts on time with interest and understand the meaning of financial contracts. Uh, and if you're a financier, that's that's a very uh, uh, important thing. I've, I mean, in my other in my last mogul book, there was uh, there's graphic descriptions of what happens to Indian financiers in Delhi in 1857. Um, when they uh, when when the the, uh, the the rebel armies go there they're, and they're literally you know they're, they're literally hung upside down by their heels until they cough up their wealth uh, and the company understood that if you cultivated the bankers and the financiers and and uh, uh, and treated them well they would lend to you and by the end you have them competing to to join in 1803 uh, you have a whole lot of letters which Kumkum Chatterjee found uh, and uh, Lakshmi Subramaniam uh, of, of the different bankers um, competing to to finance the army uh, and and all wanting to be a part of this and why because they make a profit uh, and they see and you know it's, it's one group of financiers talking uh financially the same language as another group of financiers and, and even though one lot of vegetarian Jains from you know uh, uh, from from from, from uh, uh, Rajasthan and the others are sort of you know uh, John Bull beef-eating Englishmen at some level 
they understand each other as you know that they can make a profit from each other that you know that they understand the business of interest rates and finance and and they form this alliance and that's what creates the company rule so do you want to well i was going to simply push a little uh, will to ask i mean whether that the story there looks a little bit different from that of the court chroniclers of Shah Alam and others, uh, right? Whether that story would um, would look, uh, you know, we don't have as many sources about those um, uh, bankers, uh, the sort of middle merchants uh, who were uh, invested in the advance of company rule. Um, and there are clearly sort of disputes within the company as well that would be um, and, and those who were critical of uh, the return of Clive uh, when he returns in 1765 and the sort of monopoly state that's, that forms. Um, I wonder if you might address those. Well, obviously, with, with mogul sources, as with any historical source, you've got to use them critically and, and understand where they're coming from and, and, uh, and, and sort of uh, account for that. Um, my my favourite source in this book, although uh, in, in a sense it's once been available to everybody for 200 years, is, is Gulab Hussein Khan in the Sayyam uh, And I, I feel that he's rather like sort of, you know, Edward Said from the other end of the telescope. Uh, Edward Said sitting in, in 1977 writing Orientalism just after colonialism is, is, is in its sort of di death rows. It's just Mau Mau and sort of Kenya is just sort of finishing off and it's, you know, the last Gulf states are, are, are getting their independence. And he's writing about what colonialism looks like then. Gulam Hussain Khan is, is his direct equivalent in 1780s Calcutta, realising for the first time the pennies dropping, what colonialism actually means for a man in his position. He's from a Mughal family, he's from a service family who've been cavalrymen for uh, the Mughals, they've been given landed estates, they're mansabdars, uh, and suddenly they're completely out of a job. They're completely screwed. Uh, the, the, the army these days is all about infantrymen, uh, they want uh, yeomen uh, and Brahmins and Rajputs from Bihar and Avad. Uh, and they've absolutely no use at all for uh, for, for Mughal cavalrymen who've been who've been the, the privileged elite of the Mughal court. Not only that, he notices that you know the Brits uh, are building classical buildings. They often want to import their own furniture from London. They don't want uh, they they have their own portrait painters. They don't need the uh, uh, the the court artists. They um, have very little interest in uh, Indian dancing girls except for when the dance is over. Uh, and, and that whole world of incredibly elaborate uh, 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 mogul court culture, which which you know a man like Gulam Hussein Khan has been brought up to uh, to valorize and and think of uh, as this as 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 high culture, is over in a generation. Suddenly, it doesn't mean a thing. It's 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 totally uh, undermined and devalued. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, I think he is a spectacular source, and one which I say, you know, he, he was uh, he was translated into English by this extraordinary character in uh, this Greek living in Moshidabad in uh, in in, this, in the seventeen uh, eighties, and and it's been sitting there, um, mm. and, and and amazingly, um, I, I'm surprised it's used so little because it's such a good source. It's four volumes. It's incredibly detailed. It does all sorts of sort of you know. It's less useful if you're dealing with Tipu or something because he wasn't there. But he he's right in the Mashidabad court. Uh, he's a cousin of Siraj Dalla. He knows all the the court factions and uh, the different begums and the different cousins, and and it's a spectacular. So I I think, um, yes, yes, of course, you've got to use mogul court sources carefully as you have to use any source. Uh, uh, but uh, I think they're much undervalued and and underused. James, do you want to? Yeah, um, William, I want to ask a question, um, and basically it. You know, you, your your book, The Anarchy, remind 21st century readers, or actually probably makes many 21st century readers aware for the first time of the the absurdity in world historical terms of a commercial corporation, right, responsible for the short term interests of its shareholders, ruling over a vastly populated subcontinent. Two hundred million people. Yeah, yeah. And oh, I was I was reviewing the book in preparation for our dialogue today, and just thinking, you know, there's this <laughs> expression about the the Prussian state that it, it's not a, uh, a country with an army, but an army with a country. And, you know, what your book makes clear is that this is a commercial corporation, you know, and, and shareholders that possess, that, that have a bureaucracy, that has an army, that has a country. 
<laughs> and the complete <laughs> absurdity of that. And, and, and I want to pose to you, because I was wondering which side of this, because I can see material in your book for you falling on either side of this. So I'd like to ask, there, there is sort of going back to observers of the first century of the company Raj, before it becomes the crown Raj, all the way from, say, Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations to Karl Marx's writings on the British Empire in India, there's, there's been kind of two positions. One position that this is all just haphazard, right? A lot of just kind of purely empirical historians like to take that view that it's just this haphazard circumstance. This is uncontrollable, unforeseen contingency. And this entire, you know, motley crew of British imperial rule where nobody knows who's responsible to anybody else, shareholders and a board and a bureaucracy and an army and zemadars, that, that this is all just, you know, completely um, contingent and accidental. And then there are those like Adam Smith and then later Karl Marx who sort of argue, no, this whole thing serves a series of interests. It's not that it's, you know, a cabal has designed it exactly, but rather that there are a series of social and political interests that are definitely served. And behind all of this is a very, you know, politically autocratic and economically extractive project that is serving some people in South Asia and some people in the metropole in Britain. And, and, and they, you know, they may not have designed this, but they're very happy with the way it works, right, with the way the world is. And I'm wondering where you would fall in that, 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 that kind of opposition. Oh, well, I, I know where you have. You've fallen on this one. <laughs> and, and I've much enjoyed reading you uh, on this. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I'm very, very uh, interested in, 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 in your answer to that question. Um, which we you, you must give after I've done mine, but um, I think it's a I think it, it, it's a, it's it's such a complicated and long story. I mean, these indie companies starts at the time of Shakespeare, and it's you know it's still there by the by the time of uh, uh, of Burke uh, and, and Hastings, and um, uh, and then uh, right into the mid nineteenth century, uh, and it's different things at different times. Um, I mean, it's completely different things at different times. And, uh, uh, but I think a lot of the stuff in the crucial period of the 1750s and 60s is reactive. Um, Plassey is not planned. Uh, I mean, first of all, I mean, there, there's a whole series of cockards. First of all, uh, there's a misunderstanding about a French fleet, and Clive is sent out to... Uh, to uh, India to go and chase the French fleet that, in fact, has gone off to to to, to Canada. Uh, so he arrives in 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 Madras and, without anything to do, and, he, and then thank God for him. Uh, suddenly, the news of the fall of Calcutta comes, and he and he and he go, can go off and make his name. Uh, and uh, and then he's about to go home, and he writes to his dad saying he's he's, he's retaking Calcutta, and he's off back to Madras. And then the jagged sets that come with this with this opportunity to turn him into the richest man in Europe if he pulls off what he does. And of course, he grabs it without really particularly checking with anyone. And then the Seven Year War breaks out at the same time, uh, uh, almost the same day that the letter arrives from the jagged sets. Uh, so, so so a whole lot of contingent things happen that no one had planned. Uh, and you cannot see that as part of a conspiracy. It's quite clearly a series of, of sort of bizarre historical accidents. Uh, that the only, I mean, the, I mean, it's very uh, another interesting kind of fact. You know, what would have happened um, if Clive had not been there? He was there for an act. He was there having, due to rather like the entire Iraq War, was caused by a misreading of intelligence about yellow cake, uh, and and was manipulated, and, and so you end up in the invasion of Iraq, which obviously had nothing to do with 9/11. In the same way, a whole series of mistakes sort of the reading of a piece of intelligence about a a, 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 a French fleet seen loading up in Port Loyal uh, leads to uh, an entire company fleet to a navy fleet, royal navy fleet going off the other end of the world <laughs> and, and, and after a phantom enemy that doesn't exist that, you, know, you cannot see this as as, as part of a, uh, a a conspiracy to create empire and ditto you know the, the the whole chain of conflict that leads up to the battle of buckler in 1765 uh, there's you know there's uh, some incredibly unpleasant british factors and patna ellis and, and and bolt and so on misbehaving in patna getting into contact uh, getting into conflict with mere custom and again this is unplanned uh, no one is no one is uh, 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 neither side has, has has planned for this conflict which suddenly erupts in Padna 
uh, and Mir Kasim takes the initiative, and uh, and, and again, and, and uh, you know, bizarrely, then suddenly by uh, the Battle of Bucks, which again is very nearly lost, uh, mm-hmm. and is a very close call. Um, the company suddenly finds itself in charge of the entire Gangetic Plain, not just Bengal, uh, not just uh, Orissa and Bihar, but all the way up to the Rahila territories uh, in in uh, sort of Rampur area, uh, and. They, they didn't really even know what to do with it. They had no, no, and no one had. Uh, and and if you look at the the whole business of, of you know giving Shah Alam Allahabad and that whole business, that that was planned by Clive the night before. Uh, there'd been no plan to give Clive, Shah Alam anything. Uh, the question was whether to take over um, Shuja's territory uh, and take over Abad or not. And in the end, uh, it, it's. Um, Janti, I think, who who persuades uh, Clive to, to give a role to Shujo Dala and get him to surrender. Um, but again, so I'm giving you a complicated and long-winded answer, but it's but it, it it's it's a whole series of accidents at the beginning, and I don't want to sound like Seely, and I know you you strongly disagree with it, with, with the whole idea that there's a, a fit of absence of mind, but equally, uh, there's no way you can possibly uh, see that uh, think that there's a master plan. Uh, and so it's it's very much the cock up uh, uh, theory of history rather than the conspiracy, in in my view, in that crucial moment. If you're looking at particularly at that moment between uh, 1756 and uh, and 1765, which is the which is the crucial decade when everything changes and can never go back. Do either of you want to? Well, I, w- I wonder about that. I mean, I, now that you've raised the seven, I certainly expect James to challenge that. Go on, James. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, Samita, I'm happy to ask, follow up your question. I can follow up Steve's question. Well, I, I mean, the fifties and sixties. I mean, I, I feel like James uh, stepping on your toes, um, right? But when Clive returns to India, I mean, what do you make of sort of the the fact that the company turned down the Divani uh, on what, at least two or three different occasions before it accepts it in 1765. Um, I mean, I, I take your point about the importance of Buxer and uh, that uh, victory, uh, that, that it wasn't inexorable sort of from Plassey to Buxer that um, there would be a company state in the, in the form that it took. Um, but do you, what do you make of the sort of the metropolitan kind of ma- uh, story of how uh, there are ministries that that are involved in the East India Company elections in 64 and 60, uh, 63 and 64 um, that alter dynamics quite quite significantly. James, you should answer that. That's your, this is your, <laughs> no, this is your I, baby. <laughs> I, I, I would just say, and this is not in some kind of diplomacy. I, I think what you had said earlier, William, about a certain compatibility between two different stories is true. That is, I, I think that the idea that there is a plan for the company's rise in military and political su- uh, supremacy in northeastern India is absurd. I mean, I don't think anybody could seriously suggest that the sto- story that you just laid out is 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 not true. Meaning, I think it's incredibly contingent, unforeseen, unplanned, and your word reactive. My only response, and I guess I'd be interested to hear your response, this would be no reaction dictates a response. And I think that... Um, you know, it, it's like saying the financial crisis, no one planned, but the series of austerity policies that were pursued afterwards were not inevitable like the weather, mm-hmm. right? That they were political and there was a debate and one side won and one side lost. And I guess what, what I would put to you is, is I just think that there are um, versions of, you know, your white moguls, right? That there are people both in South Asia and in Britain who see what's happening and are aware of this rise to supremacy and are trying to bring the reading public aware of it and say, listen, this is a really, there's an empire coming and it's taking a certain shape and it might take another shape, but they're defeated by people like Clive and people like Lord North. And so there's a, so in other words, I accept completely that the, that the possibility of empire is unplanned, unforeseen. I, I what I guess I don't, where I disagree, and I'm not sure if you would share this position, I didn't take you to share Shealy's position actually, Would is that there's then a politicization, there's a debate, there's a discussion as to what form the empire should take and certain sides went out. And I guess I would just put the point that 
the fact that a certain kind of company Raj is reproduced over time in a certain kind of way, despite all of the attempts to reform it or the criticisms of it, at least suggests to me that it, it serves certain social and political interests, if you will, um, in Britain itself over time. Um, but again, I'm not claiming that this in any way means that there was a plan in, say, the 1750s to create a company Raj that would last a century, if, if that makes sense. <laughs> Uh, I, th I think you know this is, this is where we started this conversation by saying that in a sense your your book and my book are, are, are very nice echoes of each other. You know, my book tells the story of that of those that those weirdly improbable series of events that leads to suddenly in in 1765 the the company controlling all the richest area of India, mm -hmm. uh, and then as you have shown in your work, uh, the, 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 the there's a whole lot of uh, readjustment to, to take place in London. Um, to to get Clive's position in a sense reinforced and uh, and the whole politicking that uh, goes on with Sullivan and so on um, uh, takes place in London and and, and creates space um, uh, for for what emerges, um, which as you say serves very specific interests and and is one one particular vision of empire which which may never have happened in uh, in a slightly different fall of the dice. Can I just? I mean, and and, and then the old cliche, which I, and I know is, is is one that people get bored of, but the, you know, the, there is. I think it's very important to emphasise, and and I do think it's true, that you have, you know, if you are a a, a British officer in India, and you know, you basically have twenty years to make your fortune or not, uh, or die. Uh, 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 war is very good for you. And uh, particularly in a world where you have prize, which again, for anyone watching that doesn't understand what that means, it means that if you take a, uh, a city uh, violently uh, and it resists, uh, you have the right to loot it. Uh, and that's as, as true of, uh, of Indian armies as it is of, uh, of, of European armies. Uh, and a single big success like taking Tipu's capital at Sri Rangapatnam in 1799, enriches an entire generation of soldiers. Uh, everyone comes home with a, with a gold tiger in their pocket. Uh, uh, and, uh, and if you're Lord Wellesley or, uh, um, uh, uh, or Harris or um, Baird, you, know, you, you come home with, with, with a landed estate and, uh, and half of Scotland. Uh, and so it's hugely in, in your interest to have war. Uh, while, you know, and again, this is a cliche, but, you know, you, there is generations of letters coming out of Leadenhall Street saying we want a, a peaceful trade. Uh, and there's never a peaceful trade. There's always war, of course. Uh, these guys need, 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 to, need to make their loot and, and, and get home before they die. So could I just ask a little follow up? Not really. I mean, because I, you know, uh, uh, I sort of defer to your to both of your expertise on on this particular thing. But it did strike me what reading the anarchy um, uh, and reading it sort of alongside other accounts of things going on in the British Empire contemporaneously elsewhere. Um, what struck me as, you know, intriguing is the story that told here is a story about you know a company that's too big to fail a company which does things um uh you know which to the perspective of anybody sort of on the ground in uh in south asia uh i mean that is to say who isn't benefiting financially in the ways that you describe might seem you know irrational cruel uh in a, in a variety of ways um but it's a story very much in which in which the british imperial state that is to say um is largely absent right i mean it's it's these the east india company given a relatively free hand um but the contrast with the sort of standard accounts of the American Revolution, where the revolution, you know, the standard accounts, I mean, I'm not endorsing them, I'm just saying this is what most people say, is that, um, you it's know, the George big, III personally waiting for <laughs> um, Is that, you know, is that right, is that the state, the state gets too big, yeah. too mean, et cetera, and Americans want, and, uh, and, and there's a, I mean, there's a similar sort of story, really, about West, about the West Indies, right, I mean, that, 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 um, that what ends up happening, whatever was going on on the ground in the West Indies, it was the imperial state that put down slave rebellions, et cetera, et cetera, uh, uh, which therefore shaped uh, the direction of, of of these things until the state decides that slavery is a bad thing and they get rid of it and then shapes it in a different way. Um, so I guess what I'm sort of wondering is how do we account
account for the 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 increasingly strong presence of the imperial state in the in the western hemisphere at the same moment that you get you know an east india company which is sort of left to do things on its own in south asia um well, obviously, as I said, you know, there, there, there are different East India companies at different times. And uh, and obviously, the East India Company post-1774, and again after 1784, is a very different East India Company to the one we have uh, in, in 1756 or 1765. Mm-hmm. Um, what I'd love to do is back, back a, p- a question to you, um, Steve, because I don't know this stuff. I, I used in, in the Anarchy two essays by Emma Rothschild about how much the... Uh, the the patriots sitting in Boston uh, are uh, uh, fearing uh, are reading all the accounts of the Bengal famine and and yeah. and, and all the, the horror stories coming out of India, uh, and are very fearful that the company might be let loose and and hence it's East India Company tea which is shoved into Boston Harbor. How much is that actually important to the American Revolution? Is it a big deal or is it a a, a minor part of the story? Oh. I think it's, I mean, I think it's a big deal. I think, but I think it's a big deal um, precisely because, I mean, the discussion, for example, in The Alarm, which was the the, uh, the set of uh, set of essays that really criticized the, the Bengal famine in, in North America, um, see the East India Company as an agent of the of the British state. So it's it's absolutely right to say what you you point out that they're worried that the East India Company is going to be let loose in North America, but they see that as part of the state. state that this is this is yeah. this rapacious extractive state um so i mean there's no question i mean i i was struck too i mean i, I mean what what emma says and you know what you what you say um uh, uh, is absolutely right and in fact if anything um i was surprised by going through north american newspapers and west indian newspapers how much they knew about the famine. I mean, you know, uh, 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 and how concerned they were about it and what it said about British imperial rule. Does that make it into into historiography uh, of the American Revolution when you're when, you know, you, is, do many accounts of it contain this East India Company element? Uh, no, <laughs> uh, not not yet. I mean, James, you, you're you know, you're working in this in this area now. I, I don't my sense is that that if you were to ask most, you know, uh, I mean, both most educated readers who you know have consume the the material on on the American Revolution and most scholars working in the field. I don't think the story about the Bengal famine and the East India Company figures looms large in their accounts. I mean, the the Boston Tea Party absolutely, uh, but the Boston Tea Party is usually described as you know another way in which in which uh, you know North Americans were reacting to what the British state was doing. That's really exciting. I'm, I, I often, when I'm particularly when I've been giving talks to American audiences, I, I've been quoting this stuff, but have, have been very worried that I'm, I'm, I'm talking bullshit. <laughs> this isn't true. I don't know this American history at all. I'm very ignorant of it. Okay, um, so I guess it's now time to sort of pivot from questions. Uh, from from the audience and, and from our colleagues. Um, so, so, right, I'm not quite sure. I mean, so, shall we start with, with, with Depe- Depeche's question or, or how are we gonna do this? Sure. Okay, um, so so um, William, is it okay if I just sort of read out what you put in and then, sure. and then yes. Um, so he says that uh, given that there were so many wars, big and small, in the 18th century that were funded by different banking families that were in turn often given land for security, was there a process underway for bankers to become landlords, a process that somehow got interrupted by the rise of British rule? I don't know the detail of that. Um, uh, I mean, the, the person, to, the work to turn to is, is Kum Kum Chatterjee and Lakshmi Subramaniam's uh, uh, brilliant work on this, and, and and then later Chris Bailey, um, uh, which which is, has very detailed studies of these banking families. Uh, I, my impression is that you know a, a lot of I mean uh, the, these families uh, have have developed under um, mogul and late mogul 
uh, rulers and, uh, and 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 are adapting to the changing conditions by allowing uh, allowing to the company. Uh, and again, it's it, it's very uh, accidental process, but, the, but in the end, they see that the company is as as as, as simply more reliable as uh, uh, they they pay their debts quicker. Uh, I don't know any cases of the company offering estates as such to banking families. They, 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 it's, I think they're commercial contracts uh, with cash rather than uh, 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 being offered uh, old-style landed estates or zamandaris or, uh, or so on. Uh, but I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really not qualified to, to answer that detailed question about the banking families. So there's, and there's a lot of very, very good work on this, um, which... Uh, uh, Kumkum's work in particular is, is fantastically detailed and on the Patna banking families. Right, and um, so there's a there's a question from from the audience, which is uh, says seeing seeing as how the corp uh, uh, the corporation has taken over the world since the days of the East India Company, do you think that there is something inherent um, which connects corporate interests with wars? A nice question. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I mean, it's very. I mean, what I love about this whole this whole w w weird story of, of of a corporation taking over the richest country in the world, then, uh, is is the way that it. Um, you you can I think generally say this is you know all the things that the East India Company is doing is is the first time a corporation has done this. It is the first great multinational, which is. Uh, uh, there, there are earlier corporations, but none have had this sort of cross-continental power that the East India Company soon develops. And all the things that we fear in corporations today, um, for example, the way that corporations can corrupt and alter the course of domestic politics by uh, by campaign donations, by or, or simply giving wads of cash in, in envelopes, which is uh, which the, the the director of the East India Company in 1690 has put in the Tower of London for for that the first ever case of corporate corruption where where uh, cash is given to MPs uh, to get them to change their vote in this case to extend the monopoly of the company. And this whole world of corporate lobbying that exists in India, the, the whole question of you know uh, uh, Adani and and Reliance and, and and their links to the, the rise of the BJP, the whole question of Exxon Mobil and the Iraq War, all these things that we deal with across the world as corporations altering policies goes back to the East India Company. This is the first time it happens. And when you study uh, the company, you get to see the roots of this. Um, there are certainly cases where corporations bring about wars. Uh, uh, I mean, the whole history of the East India Company with its own army is, uh, is, a, is a story in itself. But you see it, you know, I suppose you, in the 20th century, look at uh, uh, 1956 in Iran with the fall of Mossadegh. Uh, and uh, that's the Anglo-Persian oil company persuading the CIA and the MI6 to bring down Mossadegh and, and, and put in the Shah. A few years later in Guatemala, um, where they're about to nationalize United Fruits territory and... Um, uh, there's a coup d'etat uh, and the socialist government is sacked and you get the phrase banana republic for the first time. Uh, then uh, 1977 in uh, in Chile, uh, where ITT gets the CIA to get rid of IND and you end up with one of the nastiest hunters in uh, in Latin American history. So this idea of a, a, of a corporation uh, interfering with countries and bringing down governments, uh, it's something that we do see today. <laughs> You know, and still to this day, who we don't really know whether the role of the different oil companies with uh, in diverting the post 9/11 response to Iraq, rather than say to Saudi Arabia or, or where all the 9/11 plotters were, was that another example of this? So uh, it, I, I, I'm very excited by the way that, in a sense, what you're seeing at, in these, you know, what look like old fusty history book. Uh, things, the Battle of Plassey, uh, is in fact the the roots of uh, of, of all these things we see subsequently, right up to the Iraq War. Right. Great. I mean, in in many ways, I, I must say, just sort of, to, I mean, that that I mean, your response, William, is a brilliant also counterpoint to what's become a sort of fashionable uh, story told by by economists now about outsourcing empire. That that it was a good idea to sort of have these companies run 
these you know multinational corporations because it sort of meant meant it much more economically efficient. So I, I mean, I, I think that was a brilliant sort of counterpoint to that story. So I have a, a final question that I mean, not from me, but from from the audience, uh, which is, uh, why do you think the history of 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 the Bengal famine is somewhat ignored in British history? Um, can you elaborate <laughs> on how uh, colonizers create history? Yeah, no, we. I mean, I did learn about the Irish potato famine just about in my case, but I certainly didn't learn about the Bengal famine. Uh, no, I mean, obviously, uh, the colonizers' textbooks contain very few uh, uh, imperial atrocities. You can go, or even now, you can go all the way through a, a British history education, um, and. Uh, even to to A level in, and and even university level without ever encountering the British Empire at all. <laughs> Never mind the Bengal famine. Uh, I mean, you get what well, you get a tiny bit of. Uh, you get you know uh, the pressure. You, you you move from the Tudors to uh, the liberation of the slaves. Then you get Florence Nightingale. Then you get Hitler. And then all the sides. The Brits are always on the side of the you know the liberators. They're, they're, they're saving people from slavery and and and, and the servitude. And, and British values means freedom. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think people find it very hard to believe what is true that the, the British don't teach their empire. Uh, there are individual history teachers who choose to do it, um, and it's in all our interest as historians of empire to lobby to get this absolutely into the heart of the curriculum, so everyone buys our books and uh, 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 we can retire and, uh, and and stop writing them. But. It, it, no, at the moment, it, this is not uh, um, this is not in the history curriculum, uh, and uh, it's it's ignored. Uh, it, it's, it's it's astonishing, but no, I, it, it's not surprising in that I don't think any nation goes out of its way to uh, to teach the bad stuff. Uh, I don't think the Israelis, you know, big up the the Nakba. I don't think uh, uh, you know. We, we we have massive courses on Mao Mao. The uh, the one exception to that probably is is the is you know, post nineteen forty five Germany, which does teach the Holocaust and uh, in a big way. Great. Um, so I think I think uh, Dipesh is now going to sort of come on and and summarize things. Yes. Up oh, there. No, he is. I'm, I'm not I'm not summarizing things. It was a wonderful discussion. <laughs> Just wanted to thank you all. But first of all, Julian, for agreeing to come on this. Thank you show and my three wonderful colleagues, Sunit and James and Steve for joining you in this conversation to Abhik and the team at proher.com for you offering us the platform for you know, that we use and to my colleagues Deni and, and Suman and Arvind at the Delhi Center and others for making all of this possible. This just goes to show what a wonderful opportunity this uh, episode, the dialogue series could be and I just wish more of my colleagues would do this kind of fun sessions, <laughs> you know, screen them. Thank you all, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. This is thank fun. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye -bye. Stay well. Bye. -bye. Bye.